Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series, Behind Every Great Cook is a Great Mother. So uh, I would like to introduce, first of all, our host, John Oda, who is a member of the Culinary Historians of Canada. John is a wonderful author. He is an architectural writer. He is um, a devoted foodie, and he is the author of um, a recently released book called The Kitchen. Thank you, Julia. That's great. Today we have two guests, and um, one guest is esteemed cookbook author Anne Lindsay, uh, best-selling cookbook author, I must say. And our second guest is Karen Liu. It's Karen Liu is a Toronto-based culture reporter for the Star. Formerly the resident food writer and recipe tester, Karen developed and tested recipes before they were published in the paper. But you're so much more than that, Karen. Lou was born in Hong Kong and moved to Canada with his family when they, he was just a baby. Now he's one of the country's leading food journalists. His identity allows him to blend the childhood memories of his grandmother's Cantonese cuisines and his knowledge of local Canadian ingredients and styles of cooking. When he writes his articles for the Star, they're very revealing articles that open our eyes to new foods. And I love it when you go into people's houses and cook her own. He's active on Twitter and Instagram. And Lou uses his voice in the cooking world to focus on diversity. He believes that food extends to all areas of culture. His work at the Star has included advocating against xenophobia through food and a way to explore cultural issues throughout the city. Karen, it's so great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's good to see anyone at this point. Um, <laughs> uh, right. Can you just tell us about your mother and your uh, influence that she had on your cooking career? Yeah. Um, well, she's currently doing our weekly grocery runs right now. So I'm in the kitchen where the Wi-Fi is not as nice, unfortunately. But um, so we grew up in a Chinese household, which means that it's very normal for three generations to live in the house. So it's usually the grandparents, the parents, and then us kids. And the way that it usually works for Chinese families is that the grandparents would do all the cooking while the parents, you know, have full-time jobs. And then us kids are in school. So when uh, grandma passed away, um, the cooking duties were kind of put on to my mom, who never really cooked because grandma did all of that. So mm. she was kind of just reluctantly had to take on those duties and she never really cooked her entire life. So it was a lot of trial by error, a lot of experimenting. I don't think she really used cookbooks and you know the internet wasn't around at that time. So it was just going off her memories of her mother's cooking and just like trying to recapture a lot of that by trial by error. And that's how I uh, kind of took my approach to cooking as well as someone who doesn't have, um, you know, the a culinary education. Like I went to um, journalism school and so I didn't, I never worked at a restaurant before. So I didn't have that proper training that a lot of, uh, food writers uh, and, and chefs had so, so I think the way that I cook it's very much like my mom like how a lot of home cooks develop their skills just a lot of trial by error trying to recapture flavors that they've had at restaurants or at people's homes and just piecing together different recipes and seeing what works for them with what they have at home. Uh, what sorts of things did uh, she cook? And what sorts of things did your grandmother cook too? Uh, the types of things. Um, so my grandmother, we're from Hong Kong. So a lot of the dishes that we had were very Cantonese based with some British influence since Hong Kong used to be a British colony. So a lot of like steamed uh, bitter greens, not a lot of spices. Um, our family doesn't really handle spice really well. So not a lot of chilies, but a lot of steamed vegetables, a lot of everything doused in oyster sauce, a lot of braised meats. Um, the, one of my, um, my favorite thing that my grandma used to make is this uh, braised pork belly with lotus root stew. And oh. 
I've never had it. At, I've never seen it at restaurants before, but I'm sure it's out there. And my mom has no idea how to make it because grandma's grandma's never wrote down recipes before. But I do have an aunt that knows how to make it. She dropped off. Um, she she dropped it off uh, a few weeks ago, and she said that like you know when this is all lifted and we can visit each other's houses again, she'll teach me how to make it. Um, as for my mom, she makes very simple dishes. It's usually steamed rice with some steamed vegetables and a protein of some sort. Sometimes it's something very simple, but it's just like um, uh, like a like a steamed dish with like ground pork inside. Um, oh, oh, yeah. And this these were the spring rolls that uh, mom made. Uh, a few weeks ago, and it's it's very simple. It's just um, bean sprouts, grated carrot, and the barbecue pork that you get at like a the Chinese butcher shop. So there's one that's near us that's still um, open and doing takeout. They're called East Court uh, Barbecue for anyone in Scarborough. So this can I try one? <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that um, I think she learned from um, Grandpa actually. Um, when he was still alive, and it's it's so simple. It's only three things, but it's it's the best spring rolls I, I find, um, especially when they're like piping hot. And she makes like hundreds of these at a time, and I can easily eat like twenty of them, no problem. I think there's another slide, right, Julia? Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, so every um, Chinese Cantonese household, they'll know how to make the Chinese steam striped bass, which is basically you take a whole striped bass and then you steam it 15 minutes for every pound and a half. And then it's the, the most important thing is the soy sauce. Um, so it's, uh, it's like a soy sauce with a little bit of sugar, lots of ginger, lots of scallions. Um, you uh, heat it up and then you have to like add piping hot oil to it. That's like yeah. the key to make it like a little bit of sweet to kind of temper the, um, the, the, the abrasiveness of the ginger and the scallions. It just renders everything very sweet, very mellow, and it's so good. So I wanted to make um, a, a vegan version of it using tofu. So mom kind of walked me through how to do that for tofu. And she was showing me how to slice the onions like Chinese people do. Oh. Basically, you, you slice them on like a very thin bias while like continuously um, turning the, the song, very thin, delicate shards of green onion. She was like, this is how Asians cut onions, not the way that you do it, because <laughs> apparently I've been doing it wrong the entire time. Um, so th this has been an experience, um, you know, being on lockdown and cooking every day and living in the same house as her and kind of uh, learning bits and pieces of her cooking and being reminded of things that she um, taught me years ago and I just kind of forgot. <laughs> Thank you for telling us about the green onions. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I love this dish, but I really didn't know about the green onions, how you slice it like that. I, I want to go down and try it right after this call. <laughs> yeah, so, so you basically, like, you take the green onion and then you just, like, very, like, a very, almost very, very, um, like, flat bias. Not on, like, a very steep angle, but very, like, yeah. And you keep rotating the onion. Oh, great. So I'm a, a great follower of yours on Instagram, and I love your uh, Instagram posts. Um, <laughs> there's always a lot of mixing of different cultures, of different uh, ingredients on that. Can you just tell us a little bit about your posts? Yeah, so out of boredom, I guess, uh, ever since uh, everyone at the start was ordered to you know, work from home, starting on March 16th or 17th, I kind of took it upon myself and be like, hey, you'd be really fun if I just um, showed off what I cooked at home uh, every day while we're on lockdown. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are finding themselves at home now, they don't really cook and, or they don't, 
they don't have the ability to get takeout or delivery every day. And they're probably like, okay, what do I do with all this stuff? I have, I already stockpiled rice, I already stockpiled beans, but what do I do with it? So I thought it'd be kind of fun um, and like a little personal challenge myself to cook something different uh, every day and to photograph the ingredients that I've used and what the yeah. final product looks like and just give very simple um, instructions on what people can do at home um, using these ingredients that I think a lot most people have at home it's all very simple stuff um, it, it's stuff that you can get at like the discount supermarket and if you don't have it you can substitute for this or, or, or that it's very loose instructions because I think that's just how a lot of people cook I you know I follow cookbooks but you know very rarely do I follow um, do I crack open a book and like look at it every day so um yeah it's just like a fun personal challenge it kind of keeps Good. my mind active for sure i love the way you lay out the ingredients so that i can see what to do so yeah cool. it, it kind of gives people an idea uh, they, they see all the ingredients and be like okay i think i have most of this stuff let's see what we can do with it so can you can I ask you a question, please? So you do beautiful work on Instagram, and every morning I look at my Instagram and I want to eat my phone because there's so many beautiful photographs of food on Instagram. What do you think's happening right now? I mean, when I look at my things, it's it's all food. I mean, you're kind of limited by the activities that you have at home, and everyone has to eat. So I think um, food for a lot of people, it's a way to, you know, number one, show off their culinary capabilities. But in, 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 but in another way, it's also to kind of do your tiniest part of helping others who are, you know, kind of overwhelmed and a little bit scared in the kitchen. A lot of people, like, I, I cook for a living, so it's not it's, it's second nature to me, but I know that I'm kind of an ex on the extreme end of a spectrum. Um, so I think shit food, it's a way to connect to other people. People have com com commented and say that, uh, oh, I've made this recipe and turned out really well, or like, oh, I've, I've kind of used a recipe as a guideline, but I used X, Y, and Z, or I adapted it um, to do this instead. And I think it's so wonderful to see other people taking my recipe and kind of own or in some cases, even improving it. And it's a way to still connect with people when we can't physically uh, be in the same space. And you know what, when it comes down to it, people are stressed. If uh, they take my, you know, dog and pony show of an Instagram and it kind of helped them, you know, <laughs> with, you know, getting dinner on the table on any night, I was gonna say Wednesday, but there's no such things as Wednesdays anymore. Um, if it helps them for like one meal, then it's like one of the tiny, tiny things that I could do while at home. Oh, well, that's great. We're watching it. We're watching it, Karen. Um, thank you for that. We're coming up to the halfway point. Can I just ask one more thing that I just have to say, I really liked your article in the star about cooking with your partner. Uh, over uh, through the through the internet and uh, your partner's uh, away in a different place. Um, did you get feedback on that article? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have already been doing it. Like we've been um, in a long distance relationship since September when he moved to New Jersey. And I think a lot of um, people who are in long distance relationships or which at this point, for it's like that for everyone. We're coming up at two months of quarantine. I think it just, a lot of it just comes up very organically. So a lot of people have kind of shared um, other ways that they've been um, getting creative. So there's a lot of um, sites now where you can play board games with other people um, via Zoom or whatever program that they have. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool way of still somewhat maintaining some sort of connection with people who are, you know, millions of, uh, of miles away. Um, yeah, you just have to learn to adapt for now and just see the bigger picture and that, you know, this is, this is temporary um, and, it, and it, you know, it, it sucks, but, you know, we'll, we'll be together again. Great. 
Great. Thank you, Karen. Karen, I'm going to uh, move along to Ann Lindsay right now. Could you, could you stay around and we'll have a Q&A in the last 10 minutes. That'd be yes, great. Yes, of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ann Lindsay. Ann Lindsay, best-selling cookbook author. Ann Lindsay was born in Vancouver and graduated from the University of British Columbia with a Bachelor of Home Economics. In 1978, Ann was appointed the Toronto Star's Home Economist, and this position began an active career in journalism. Ann has written six bestsellers. Among them, Lighthearted Cookbook, Ann Lindsay, Lighthearted Everyday Cooking, Land Lindsay, the new lighthearted cookbook, and Lindsay, and Lindsay's new light cookbook. <laughs> Let's see. In total, over two million copies have been sold of her books. A portion of the royalties went to the various health associations. These cookbooks have been translated into four languages and are sold in 14 countries. In 2003, she was awarded the Order of Canada. Anne is married with three children, nine grandchildren, and lives in Toronto, Canada. Anne, Lindsay, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Oh my goodness. Anne, could you please tell us about your childhood and cooking and your mom and the influence it all had on your cooking career? Well, she said I grew up in Vancouver, and uh, in our backyard we had cherry trees, apple trees, peach, pear. My father had a little vegetable garden, and um, my mom baked every day but Saturday. And uh, she she was a she was a really really good cook. And uh, as a you know really little little kid, I would pull my chair up to the counter and while she was baking and uh, want to help. And at a very early age, she would give me a little piece of um, pastry if she was making a pie, and I'd make my own little pie. And uh, and uh, I guess, um, and she just taught me a lot. I mean, when I was, oh, maybe about 12 or 13, she taught me how to make gravy uh, because we would have usually a roast beef or roast chicken every you know Sunday night. and. Uh, uh, having somebody else make the gravy was a huge help <laughs> and, uh, and I would just she just would I would cook along with her I guess a little bit and um, like to bake and as I got older she um, she liked to sew and I was small I was small and thin and when I was in let's say high school and university because I lived at home at university I couldn't find nice dresses that would fit me so she would sew on my clothes and she and in exchange I would cook the dinners and so she liked sewing she liked sewing I mean I didn't cook all the time but I when especially when you know she needed time extra time um I I just cook and she'd, she'd do the sewing for me so uh and then just through the years, you know, when we were, I was older, we'd exchange recipes and talk about uh, cooking quite a bit. And she was Isn't a good cook. Nice. What was your childhood kitchen like? Um, it, it, we had a uh, eating nook, you know, that five of us yes. could get into. Uh, we had a gas stove, which was probably one of the earlier gas stoves, I don't know. And uh, on the stove would always be the cast iron frying pan and beside uh, that would be a jar that had the bacon grease in it from the bacon that was cooked in the morning for breakfast. And so if anything was fried, it was fried in bacon grease, including the French fries that we would usually have every Friday night because my dad would stop at the docks on, on the way home from work and he'd buy fresh fish and we'd have fish and then he'd cook French fries in a big pot of bacon grease and that same pot would get put away in a cupboard in the kitchen that was on an outside wall and it just had a screen. It didn't have a window. So it, in the winter time, it would keep cool. Um, and that's where the pot of bacon grease was. And we'd have our French fries and we'd have uh, spaghetti and meatballs on Saturday night for dinner. Um, all, Sunday night, when I was, usually roast beef would be Yorkshire pudding and gravy and a salad and a pie that, that my mom had baked. And then on um, Monday, if, depending on how much roast beef was left over, we'd have shepherd's pie. 
and this is the meat grinder. Oh. You know, you, she would you would attach to the kitchen counter and put this the cooked roast beef in and grind it up. To and you made your shepherd's pie with the leftover gravy, and the um, she put an onion in and the the ground beef and and uh, mix that up, and then the leftover mashed potatoes would go on top. And, right. and, and so that's how the, not like today, a lot of people make it with brown beef because you wouldn't necessarily always have your leftover roast beef. But, um, and then uh, she would, uh, she, she would try new things, but we'd have, you know, chops and fried chicken and uh, um, she preserved all the fruit from the fruit trees and made her mm -hmm. own uh, fruit relish and pickles and. Good. Julia, I think we have some slides, right? That, yeah, uh, so that Ange I'll bring those up us. right now. Some lovely pictures that uh, Anne sent us to show. Okay. Oh, I could hang up. I, I could hold up some more things too. There. Oh, those are just the cooks. Oh, on the right is the, the, the that's the, uh, what we'd make applesauce in. You know, the, um, the pot that uh, you'd put the apples in and, and, um, and you just put all the cut apples and a little bit of water in a pot and cook them and you didn't peel them or anything. Then you put it all in there and sieve it and you'd get your, your applesauce. And since we had a couple of apple trees in the backyard, um, we ate a lot of apples and once the apples were picked, my dad would wrap them in newspaper and pack them in a box and they'd be stored in the garage. And so we would have those till we ran out and they would get a little bit dried out and a little bit wrinkly as they got older. <laughs> so they weren't great to have in your lunch, but they made great applesauce and that would go with the roast pork or just at some time for dessert. And, um, Oh, this is the, the, the recipe boxes that um, the two back ones for my mom's and uh, some Boston cooking school cookbooks in the back. Uh, they're really, the, one of them is really, really old. Uh, then there's one from uh, 1911 and one from 1923 that was my aunt's. And the What's Cooking uh, cookbook, that was a Kiwanis uh, cookbook that was fundraising and those were the kind of cookbooks my mom would have. A lot of recipes would just be recipes exchanged from with friends and put in the uh, recipe box. The um, glass platter at the front is one that we always had things on at home, sometimes cookies or cakes because she would bake um, chocolate brownies every day or cookies or you know we always had something like that that would go on our school lunches and um, oh the the blue dish at the back that's got uh, that's on the cake rack or the stand uh, that uh, my mom's mother died when she was young and she was brought up by her aunt and the aunt lived with us for about three or four years before she died. And this is a very, very old plate that has a nozzle uh, at the top that you would fill with hot water. So my mom would make her, well, her dinner would go on this plate with the hot water under it. And she always, she didn't eat with us, she ate in her room. So it's really old. I think it's a couple hundred years old that um, <laughs> plate. And then that's a soup tureen of hers in the back. And could I please ask you how did how did you how do you come up with your recipes? There are so many, and and do you do you have a staff? Do you do it by yourself? Well, uh, at, no, at first I did it all myself, but then I had um, a friend who was from home ec and at high school and university at UBC lived a couple blocks away, and we're friends, and she um, helped me with the testing. But I usually was the one that created the things. But after I ever did one and I'd write it all down, I'd always have somebody else make it to make sure that the, you know, they could follow my instructions and we'd test things a couple of times. But we traveled a lot and I got ideas and I love to cook. And, um, you know, sometimes you'd put a couple of recipes together. You'd get ideas from, ideas from eating out at restaurants or just what I happened to have in my refrigerator. That's what happened a lot of the, uh, of the time. Uh, and uh, just would 
sometimes, well, sometimes you'd have an idea and it wouldn't work and you'd try and you'd try and you'd add more things and it was very frustrating, but uh, it was really <laughs> fun when you created something new that <laughs> you, that, that you really liked the, the taste of. So, um, I was and, and many of your books, uh, they're all in partnership with the Heart and Stroke Foundation, uh, Canadian Medical Association. How did, how did you develop those partnerships? Um, I was uh, the food editor of a magazine called uh, City Woman uh, a long time ago, and uh, Karen Hanley was the editor, and she was on the board of the Cancer Society, and a, they came out with new guidelines to reduce your risk of getting cancer for everybody, and she said, you know, we need a cookbook based on these guidelines, and uh, would you like to write it? I've been wanting to write a cookbook for years, but it took... It took somebody saying, you know, here, why don't you do it? And I had studied a lot of nutrition. And so this was really interesting. I loved, I just, I really <laughs> liked trying to make healthy cooking appeal to everybody, you know, appeal to everybody and be easy. Um, and uh, that's why the first book we called Smart Cooking, we didn't want to have cancer or anything in the, in the topic. And while I was writing this book, I thought, you don't just eat healthy for one reason. You eat healthy for, you know, all sorts of reasons, including heart disease. So I phoned the heart and stroke and said, uh, what do you recommend on how many eggs should somebody have in a week? And they said, why? And I told them and they, and so they said, well, um, maybe, maybe you'd like to write a book for the heart and stroke. So that's, that just, and Tony Graham was a, cardiologist who was on the board and very keen on the book and he 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 really kind of promoted that so I, I was very very lucky to have these associations they were terrific very nice thank you uh we're coming up uh towards the end here so uh juliet are there any questions from the audience yes uh, a couple of <laughs> there <are>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, first one is for uh, Caron. How did you move from journalism to food journalism? Um, because I sucked at <laughs> becoming a general assignment reporter. Um, so I went to uh, Ryerson to do their Bachelor of Journalism program, and I graduated in 2008. And back then, our options were to be a general assignment reporter, which is something that covers everything from like crime to courts to just everyday stuff happening in the city. And we could specialize and become entertainment reporters or sports reporters. Food writing wasn't really an option back then. So I started my career as a general assignment reporter covering courts and crimes. And then I absolutely hated it. I wasn't good at it. It was mentally and and emotionally draining. And so I pivoted and started uh, an internship at a magazine called Toronto Life. And the first week that I started there, they launched a food and restaurant blog. And that's kind of how I got my start. I didn't know anything about um, uh, cooking or, or dining out. I was, you know, 20 or 21 at the time. I didn't have any money to go eat at restaurants. I knew nothing about who the chefs were. I didn't cook at the time, but, you know, eager intern, just wanting to do anything and everything. I was like, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll write stuff. And I asked a lot of dumb questions, but a lot of the chefs and restaurateurs were very patient in explaining um, just how things work um, in the industry and what ingredients, certain ingredients are. You know, they're patient, most likely because they didn't want me to get it wrong when I wrote about it. Um, and that's kind of how I got my start. And in terms of cooking, you know, as I wrote more about restaurants and uh, different cuisines, of course, naturally, it kind of got me curious and into the kitchen myself. So that's kind of how I got my start into cooking. Great. Um, next question is for Anne. Um, what do you think is the most important thing a mother can pass down to uh, her child about food and cooking? And when um, should children start learning how to cook? And I'm sure you have experience both from teaching your children and your grandchildren. Yeah. Um, 
I think, uh, oh, there's so much. If, if you love cooking and you like eating and enjoying your food and you talk about it a bit, I think that helps with your kids. Um, pray, you, one thing that happened in my family growing up with uh, one brother was a fussy eater. Um, when my kids were growing up, the one that I had was a little bit of fussy eater. We didn't pay any attention to. We didn't give him any attention. And we just praised the other kids. If they had not, we didn't praise them, but if they liked something and we said, isn't it great? And we talk about stuff. So I think um, just trying to sound, get how enjoyable food is. And kids can start at a pretty young age to help in the kitchen. I mean, four and four year old, five year olds, they can all help. And I have a, I have a little cooking club with my uh, granddaughter here who is eight and I'd pick her up after school and bring her um, to my house and we would cook something every Monday. And now we're doing a FaceTime. We're doing a little bit of cooking, but her uh, six year old brother wants to get involved. And so he's as happy to cook too. And so I, ha I think just letting them cook and helping and they love, I mean, one of the easiest things to learn to make is pancakes. You know, they, they love, they like that, or they want something sweet. So, and don't worry about the mess. Don't worry about the cleaning up because that'll come. Can I, can I add something to this? Mm -hmm. um, so my mom and grandparents, they pushed me out of the kitchen when I was a kid. They don't want me to take up any cooking skills because um, they wanted me to focus on school and get an education and, and all that fun stuff. So I didn't, I literally did not start cooking until after university and I had so much to catch up on. So if you can teach, get your kids in the kitchen early and let them know that it's a life skill. It's a means of survival, especially now when we, we, a lot of people have to cook for them themselves get them early like um and said make something like start simple something simple like pancakes or getting them to just like wash vegetables or like wash the rice something very very simple to just get them used to um having their hands on on food and, and just working with it and pay attention to all the work that goes into it so let them know that you know food that doesn't magically appear on your plate <laughs> already hot and ready to eat. No, a lot of work goes into it. So if they can appreciate all the labor that, you know, their moms especially put into it, then that's really good because I was an ungrateful little brat. <laughs> it's very much my teens because I was so detached from the cooking process. Oh, also, uh, so Anne has his, her beautiful like meat grinder and all her plates and heirlooms. So I'm just looking around the kitchen to see if I have anything to show off because I don't have, um, I, didn't, I didn't come as prepared for show and tell. So, but I do have this. This is a heirloom container of various soy sauce packets and ramen seasoning packets that <laughs> have accumulated for the past year. I will be passing this on to my children. Um, there's a nice assortment of various soy sauce packets and instant ramen packets that I do use for cooking. So this will be my family heirloom. And that's it. <laughs> well, we're, we're at the end for today. On behalf of the Culinary Historians of Canada, I'd like to thank Anne Lindsay and Karen Liu for joining us today and sharing your thoughts about your moms and your childhood kitchens and, uh, and your sentiments about growing up. Yeah. In the meantime, please stay well, please stay strong and happy cooking. Thank you very much.